I have here a review unit of the M3 MacBook Air, probably Apple's best selling computer and definitely the best selling entry level MacBook we've ever had. If you saw my M2 review or my Mac buyer's guide, you'll already know I love this machine and a lot of that positive stuff is still the same. There are some new features I'm gonna go over, but there are still some negatives that I heard about on Twitter as soon as I posted about this. I'm gonna save those for the end because I think overwhelmingly this is a great machine, but there are a couple downsides. So what is new? Well, the biggest thing is it's moving it onto the M3 chip platform, which was a surprise release at the end of 2024. I would have thought that chip would have just been getting announced now. So uh, the whole line has now moved to M3, which is great. And a big thing is that this also means the M1 has been discontinued. So now all of them are on this same design platform. They all have the more squared off edges, the two USB-C ports and MagSafe, which I think has been a huge improvement. And the M2 is still around for a lower price of $999. According to Apple, it has up to 18 hour battery life and can be up to 60% faster. Now in the real world, obviously that can be a little bit different. And so far Geekbench scores are telling us that it's about 20% faster than the M2 in terms of single core performance and 18% faster in terms of multi-core. And maybe the biggest update is that now when the lid is closed, it can run up to two external displays at the same time. I know this is something people have a lot of opinions about because I heard from them as soon as I posted the news about this. I'll get into it a little bit more later. The model in front of me here, this is the 15 inch in the midnight color, which is my absolute favorite of the MacBook colors. And if you saw in the MacBook Pros, they updated that black to have a more fingerprint resistant coating, which I'm gonna put to the test right now. Hopefully it's not too bad, because otherwise I'm gonna have to clean this for the rest of the video. So I think it's pretty clear that this does still take fingerprints. It isn't a complete fix. Um, it is much better than some other computers like you know the, the Razors, which are uh, even much more fingerprinty than this. So if you're really sensitive to it, I'd still recommend checking out a lighter color like Starlight, which just will always show fingerprints a lot less. So they've tried to make it better, but I know for people that are sensitive about fingerprints, it's not that big of a change, but I still think it's worth it. This midnight looks great. Another thing that was new from Apple in this announcement, not regarding this computer specifically, but they were using the terms AI and LLMs in a few different places, which I've noted before, like they generally avoid, like everyone else was picking up these buzzwords, but Apple was like, no, we're still gonna refer to it as machine learning or just talk about specific use cases. But obviously AI has hit that breaking point where Apple needs to use the word that everybody else is right now. So I don't know, this doesn't really mean anything, just that Apple has definitely acknowledged it more and be really interesting if we see some OS features that utilize it in a more forward, obvious way, especially Siri, that'd be cool to see. All right, but who is the MacBook Air for? Because a lot of the time on this channel, I'm talking to a creative audience that are editing photos and videos, which is pretty intensive on a computer. And to me, the Air is really the everybody computer. Most people walk into an Apple store and this is basically what they walk out with. So what I think is really interesting about it isn't so much that it's designed for creative professionals, but that an average person that picks one of these up as a student or just a general knowledge worker, they may not push their computer that hard most of the time, but it's now able to take on some of those more heavy duty tasks like photo and video editing that previously they could not do in the Intel era of MacBook Airs. We're at this point now where the entry level computers can handle everything, even if they don't specialize in it, but it means that if you wanna dabble in it, you can and it's not gonna crumble under the pressure of running Photoshop or Lightroom or Final Cut Pro or whatever it is. So let's take a look at some of those. Editing in Final Cut, working with 4K files, it runs perfectly smooth, never dropping frames, it can export quickly, even stacking a few different effects like running the Motion VFX plugin Roto AI, which is pretty intensive. Like this is stressing the computer and you can definitely still do it. You might wait a little bit longer than if you're using a MacBook Pro, but it can totally get the job done. Again, back in the Intel era, the MacBook Airs couldn't do this. So I love that you are able to still run intensive things like these motion VFX filters or titles. Not that long ago, even the MacBook Pros were dropping frames on playback from Canon and Sony footage. And now the Airs can handle that same 4K footage without a problem. Exports are quick enough. Obviously, again, not as fast as a Pro, but you can do it. Same goes for Lightroom, importing photos is fast enough. Exporting photos is fast enough. Working in Photoshop, it doesn't really slow down. If you need to work through a lot of files, like you're exporting hundreds or thousands at a time, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna wait longer, but it can do it. It has the same 500 nit display as the previous model, which is 
bright enough for most things. The color accuracy and consistency and sharpness is a lot of the reason that MacBooks are always the standard in the creative industry. You know what you're gonna get out of them. So the MacBook Pro display is still obviously much nicer. It's more expensive, but this holds up just fine. So if you spend a lot of time streaming video, it's gonna look great, the battery's gonna last, and this computer is just like designed for it. If you're into gaming, well, this is a strange choice of a machine. I still don't think it's optimized for it, but we are definitely entering a new era of how Macs approach gaming. Even though they are still missing a lot of AAA titles like Fortnite or Apex Legends aren't gonna be on here. Apple clearly wants to bring more AAA titles, like Boulder's Gate came out right away for it. And I've been playing Lies of P, which I've been impressed with the frame rates, like it can run totally smoothly. Although you have to turn down a few settings. I'm at a higher resolution, but also highest performance. So as long as you don't have the graphics cranked, it's gonna run perfectly smooth. It hasn't been dropping frames, but it might struggle if you really try to crank them up like you would on a gaming PC. But the M3 Air does support gaming mode, so it has lower latency if you're using it with a Bluetooth controller and better refresh rates. And the point is that you can play these games at all, again, Intel MacBook Air is just couldn't handle this. So Apple clearly wants every single device to have a baseline of being able to play very good games with solid graphical fidelity. Like this is still better than I'd say a Switch. So now I think the next step for Apple is just working on their developer relationships so that they want to build more games for Mac. We all wanna play more games, uh, they, just, they just need to be available. The speakers are still excellent, much better than most PC laptops still, but not as good as a MacBook Pro. And now let's get to the negatives, because this is what everybody was talking about. As soon as I tweeted the news about this, all of the responses were either about the eight gigabytes of RAM in the base model or the 256 storage, or the fact that it took so long to get those two external displays and you still need to close the lid. So first, those displays. On the M series chips, Apple only has one display controller. So they can't really just add more displays and I think they've kind of worked some magic to even have this be able to run those external ones. Dave2D was speculating, and I think you might be right, that before you were able to keep the laptop lid open and run one external display. So now they're just like redirecting that display when it's closed to do two externals. That seems right to me because they haven't totally redesigned the architecture of the chip. And this is very fair criticism if you're otherwise looking at PCs. I know some people it's just vital to run multiple external displays. I'm glad they can handle it. That is a big step forward for them, but it's been a weak point of the series in general. I found on the M2, it would actually lag occasionally if I had the lid open and was running an external display. So that has improved. They're clearly working on it, but it's sort of just know that if that's critical to you, this might not be the right laptop for you. You might be looking at a MacBook Pro. Now, the eight gigs of RAM and 256 storage, this drives everybody crazy. And I think that if Apple ever takes care of this, they will basically be nothing for reviewers to be complaining about anymore. Cause like th that's the most common thing we complain about every single time. Like it is 2024, it's been a decade or more of these exact same specs on base models. And it's very expensive to upgrade. $200 more to go from eight to 16 gigs of RAM and another $200 to go to 512 gigs of storage. Those are very expensive upgrades and you have to do them when you purchase the computer. And I find with eight gigs of RAM, because I've spent quite a bit of time working on those M series with not enough RAM, technically, what most people say, and they can still handle most of what I'm talking about, the photo and video editing. Like it's enough, it's constrained. You might have to close some extra windows or wait a little longer, but it is more usable than I think a lot of people frustrated with the numbers might have you believe. Still. Apple should resolve this either by lowering the prices, which won't happen, or raising that baseline. But average non-power users will get by without it. And same thing with the internal storage. You know whether you need to upgrade or not. But here, this is where I can talk about who is this computer for. So the clearest recommendation I can make is for people that want portability above anything else. The 13 inch really is tiny. It is so thin. It is so light, you, you just absolutely can't beat it. And then the 15 inch is a large screen, which to me is you know kind of a requirement for video editing in a very thin package. But it's a little bit of a situation where you're paying for the premium of the smaller size. Because if you're pricing out this 15 inch and you wanna upgrade the RAM and the storage, you might as well get the 14 inch MacBook Pro. It's only $100 more and it's gonna come with more external ports. And I mean, that $100 is worth it just to have the internal SD card and the HDMI. So in that case, I think you should upgrade. The 15 inch is for people that can spend a little more to have something compact. And finally, a lot of people buying MacBook Airs just want the lowest price Mac they can get. They want something they can afford 
And I'd actually recommend taking a look at the M2 Air for $9.99, which is a great entry price and is still gonna perform incredibly well. There's not a crazy huge jump in performance with the M3, so I'd take a look at that M2 if you just wanna save some money. And that's all I've got for now. I'm gonna be digging into this computer more and hopefully do another buyer's guide updated for the M3 Air so you know which Mac to buy. If you'd like to see that, let me know in the comments. I'll see you guys in the next video.